Thanks, everybody. I'm excited to be here. Uh, let's dive right in. Um, in this talk, I want to discuss how you can get visibility into your cluster's architecture, health, and cost using BPF. And I want this talk to be top down. So I'm going to start with a demo and show you what kind of uh, visibility you would want to get. Uh, then go into how you could collect this type of telemetry. Um, spoiler alert, uh, you extract data from Linux and your orchestrator and merge it to together, what we call flow data, as opposed to your metrics, logs, and tracing data. Um, I'm going to discuss pros and cons of, of flow, um, this type of flow data, um, the challenges in collecting it and why you need BPF, what led us to use BPF as the technology to collect it, go through a complete architecture of how you would build a system to analyze flow data, evaluate overhead and performance, and uh, briefly discuss one of the disadvantages and how we can overcome it uh, in application level metrics. So quickly, a quick note about myself. I'll tell you a bit about my history. Um, I first was exposed to these large scale operational challenges as part of work in a government technology agency. I spent seven years there. I started by developing systems that were deployed at scale in the field, mission critical systems, but it quickly became apparent that it it, that we have an operations problem. We had 10 to 20 operators who kept firefighting, waking up in the middle of the night to deploy configuration changes, restore connectivity, and deploy new software versions. Um, so I switched to the infrastructure organization and built systems to monitor and automatically and semi-automatically mitigate failure. Um, I then moved to MIT uh, to do a PhD in these monitoring and mitigation systems that are extremely low overhead, uh, low latency, high throughput. Uh, for example, we had a system called FastPass where there was a centralized server which we called the Arbiter. The Arbiter collected from every server in the cluster all the packets that server wanted to send to every other server in the network. So with a complete view, the Arbiter could analyze this traffic and then allocate which server sends to which server um, uh, So uh, according to organizational policy. Um, so this uh, Arbiter allocated two terabits of traffic, of, data, uh, of traffic per second with 50 microseconds of latency. Uh, it was deployed at Facebook in production during 2013. So this is just to give you a background into what technology we're bringing into this type of visibility. Um, I uh, started Flowmill two years ago in order to get better visibility for operations. So I'm going to start with this demo application. I think many of you know this. It's a great... Uh, it's a, a great open source project. Um, I want to thank uh, Google Cloud Platform for open sourcing this. Um, and this is the hipster shop. Um, so um, if you haven't seen it, it's this e-commerce site that you can deploy on Kubernetes. Uh, you can go and buy these hipster items, maybe buy four of these terrariums. It has a ch uh, shopping cart, a checkout. Uh, you, can, you can place your order and such. So how does the system look? Uh, in practice, let's go in and see how the deployment looks. So usually you have this Kubernetes manifest that tells you uh, what are the services. You can see here there's a front-end service, the cart service, the checkout service, and so on. Um, usually when you want to operate these systems, this is not enough. What you want is an image of how, uh, how your system interacts, how your components interact, and how your system is built. Um, so luckily, um, many organizations create these, um, these architecture diagrams. And uh, the hipster shop also has this architecture diagram. Um, unfortunately, these architecture diagrams are frequently not up to date. So when you're dealing with an incident, it gets really hard to understand what's happening. What you would want is something like this, where you reconstruct the, uh, the architecture of your system from live data in real time. Um, here you can see the front-end service, the load generator, um, and so on. Um, so if, if we go back to the architecture diagram, what I did is I rearranged all the um, services uh, in the real-time graph uh, so that we can overlay the architecture diagram. I hope this is visible. And what you can see that is that um, with the vanilla deployment of the hipster shop, the email service and the payment service are, are not in use. So those are the type of things that you really want when you operate uh, services at scale. Uh, the other thing you can get out of this when you have real-time data is 
when you have a deployment, you, make, you deploy a new version of a service, you want to understand, did, did, does it have the same dependencies? Um, is it getting, uh, does it have a new dependency? Uh, is the old dependent, are the old dependencies all working as you expect? So this gives you confidence when you deploy. Uh, another thing a real-time architecture map gives you is the ability to understand your load balancing and high availability architecture. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to exp expand this front end uh, by availability zone. Bit jumpy, but here we have two nodes, the front end on US West 2B and the front end on US West 2A. I'm going to now also expand the cart service. And you can see front end is communicating, front end on 2B is communicating with cart service on 2B. And also, I guess that's what it's communicating to. And the front end on 2A is communicating with the cart service on 2B. But neither of these front end nodes are communicating with the cart service on 2A. So this is uh, an artifact of how Kubernetes load balances uh, pods to services, uh, services to pods. Um, and kind of this is something that you would want to know about your deployment. Also, if you have a high availability architecture, what's running in what availability zone? So what are the dependencies that you have? OK. Um, second item, so we went through architecture. Uh, now I want to discuss health. How can you find uh, what's happening in your cluster using this data? Um, so I'm going to introduce uh, service degradation in this product uh, catalog service. I'm going to do some manual chaos engineering. So let's go to these, um, to these nodes. Um, so here are the nodes, the, sorry, the pods I'm going to introduce to this product catalog service. So first, I want to get uh, the network interface that the pod has. Sometimes you can have a system do this for you. I'm going to do this manually for the demo. So this is interface 100, 142. I'm then going to SSH to the Kubernetes node and get the list of the IP addresses. So we're, we want 142 here. So here it is. So this is the network interface on the node that is matched to the pod interface. Um, so 142. So I'm going to add some uh, delay. So let's say 75 milliseconds. Before I do this, I want to introduce kind of the dashboard you can, you can use to look at this. So here is the same data that you saw in the graph, the map view uh, in dashboards. So you can see TCP throughput drops and round trip time. Uh, also, SYN timeouts, I'll talk about these a bit later. And here I've filtered to only show the product catalog service. I know this might, must be a bit, uh, the font might be small, but uh, I don't think you need to read it right now. Um, so here I'm going to introduce the delay. And refresh here. And here, look at the round trip time. So very quickly, you can see measurements. So the idea is to get this in real time, get all this data. Um, Uh, this is one second granularity data. I'm going to remove the remove this delay. Um, so yeah, the system should recover very quickly when you remove this. So the round trip time here decreases. Here you have a sample that has low round trip time. Um, so this is one of, the, one of the types of service degradation that you want your system to show you. Of course, I've, I'm showing you uh, dashboards, but of course, you can create alerts based on this. Um, the other thing I'm, I, I want to show you is maybe uh, discovering if your security groups are misconfigured. So I'm going to deny traffic going to the Redis server, the Redis um, uh, uh, node here. Um, I'm going to do this by just editing, manually editing the uh, the security group. Usually, you'd have a typo in your Terraform or whatever architecture, whatever uh, technology you're using. So this is the port 6379 that you usually use. Let's say I fat fingered it and wrote a zero here. Um, let me introduce the dashboard first. So this is the kind of this is the similar dashboard where I filtered only to the Redis node. <clears throat> I'm going to save. Refresh, and very quickly, we see SYN timeouts. So these are timeouts in connection establishments. 
And uh, so also, you could alert on these. So these shouldn't really happen. Uh, and they're definitely shouldn't happen like multiple times in consecutive seconds. So this is another type of, uh, uh, of fault that you can discover with flow data. I'm going to just revert this. OK, I'm breezing through this. I'm sorry, but uh, let's head to the third category, which is cost. So we, done, we did architecture and health, and now cost. Um, when you run on the public cloud, there is a dollar cost for communication between availability zones and an even higher cost for communication between regions. Um, can you get a real-time view of how your application is behaving so you can optimize it? Um, so here. Here's a dashboard where I filtered only through the traffic from this demo. I'm going to zoom in on this throughput graph. And what I'm going to do now is I'm going to add a breakdown uh, of source traffic by availability zone. This adds this column. So you can see traffic going from the front end on 2B to any node of load generator regarding, regardless of what availability zone it's in. Now I can add a breakdown on, this, on the uh, destination side, so now you can see traffic from on the front end from 2B to load generator 2A, 2B to 2A, and so on. And I'm going to add another filter. Um, you can, I'm sorry, I'm going to filter only uh, traffic between uh, different zones. So usually you'd do, a, you'd have a dashboard that does this, but I wanted to show the filtering. Um, so here sort by total amount of traffic. You can get a list of your top talkers, so you can optimize. And this is by pod. And availability zone. You can get a similar thing by, uh, by uh, node. So just to summarize so far, we've seen these uh, five use cases across three categories in the architecture, getting more confidence in your deployments and having a real-time view of your architecture, uh, understanding your, real, your high availability architecture and load balancing. By the way, this is if there's one slide you remember out of this talk, this should be it, right? So. Um, for health, uh, you can understand, uh, you can see service degradation very quickly and understand security groups. And for cost, you can see traffic across zones or regions. And you can do all of this with flow data. OK, now we did this. I want to go into how you get this flow data. What is in this data? Um, you assemble it from two sources. From the Linux kernel, uh, you can get information on uh, very frequently, let's say every second, on what each source uh, is talking to for every socket, right? What each source IP address, destination IP address, and ports are talking, kind of how much they're sending, number of packet drops, round trip time, and SYN timeouts and such. From Kubernetes, uh, you can get metadata of the pod. So the IP address, the name of the deployment, and the pod the image that is serving the, the, uh, for each container, the, uh, the tag of each image, so this is the version of your service running, and the zone that it's running in. So all of these are failure domains that you can then extract um, telemetry for and understand if that, is, that failure domain is affecting your uh, service. Uh, so together, when you combine the two, this is a very powerful data set. Um, you can understand, is this service failing to that service? Is this version of this service failing to that version of that service, et cetera? I'm going to go through. Uh, so I've told you what you expect to get out of it, how to get it, and then uh, what, what are the benefits and the disadvantages. So the advantages are, uh, one, you don't need to change your application. That's great. Uh, unlike with custom metrics or logs or traces, where developers constantly have to maintain uh, instrumentation in the application, here you get everything from the kernel and orchestrator. So there's, the deployment is easier, and there's uh, lower organizational cost. Um, you also get 100% coverage, because everything that passes through the operating system you can capture, and that's everything. Uh, unlike other technologies here, you don't, we don't have to support many languages and many frameworks. So it's very easy to hyper-optimize all the collection points, so you can get very low overhead collection. Um, and there's more about this in the evaluation section. I'll show you some uh, benchmarks and results. And uh, you can get uh, visibility into external services, external APIs, managed services, databases, and such, uh, the same way as you get for your normal services. The disadvantage, there's one major, major disadvantage. 
the the flow, flow data, as I've shown you so far, doesn't collect application layer error codes or metrics at all. And usually when kind of when you operate for a business purpose, you want to understand how the users are experiencing the application, what's failing and what's not, and this doesn't do that. Um, it has these advantages, but it doesn't collect the error codes. Um, you can get proxies. So usually we found that throughput of a service is a proxy for service health, because once the service starts sending 400 or 500 error codes, the error responses are tiny compared to regular payloads. So you immediately see a drop in throughput. So you can use that. But still, it's a proxy. This is something that we want to fix. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to discuss this uh, very shortly at the end of the talk, towards the end of the talk, how you could solve that. I wanted to front load that uh, uh, disadvantage. But the advantages are, are uh, large. OK, so now I want to deep dive into how you can extract this uh, flow data from Kubernetes. Uh, let's say you have a pod A that wants to communicate to a service X and service X is backed by a pod B. <coughs> the way Kubernetes works is kubeproxy configures IP tables on the node that A is on uh, to, with a virtual IP address for X. Uh, a establishes a connection to X, and then IP tables maps that X address to B's address, so maps the A to X connection to A to B, uh, and B just sees packets as if they're coming directly from A. So how do you get this flow data? Uh, first, all the pod metadata you can get from the Kubernetes APIs. The socket level information you can get with the SS utility in Linux. So this is widely available. Um, here you can see A to X communicates how many bytes. There's also run trip time and other metrics. And from contract, you get information about the IP tables, the actual rows in the NAT table. So here you see the mapping from A to X to A to B. So this is, this is great. Like, all the tools are there. You can build a solution like this. Um, CLI has a problem, which is what is going to lead me to BPF. Um, first is performance. Um, that, the performance is actually not the deal breaker, but I want to address it first. So here is a test that we ran on a production machine. Uh, it shows on the x-axis the number of sockets, and on the y-axis how many million cycles it took to run SS. Um, you can see that kind of from this result, the regression line, uh, every socket that, that SS touches costs 79,000 cycles. And when you run this every second and you have a lot of these sockets uh, open on the machine, then it's going to get expensive. Because, and the reason is the tool is built for the CLI. Um, Another reason is it iterates over all the sockets in the system, even if they didn't have any data on them. So you're paying even for sockets that are not helpful to you. Um, but maybe the you know, more important problem is coverage. Uh, the CLI tools are built for polling. So what you do is maybe every second or every 10 seconds, you run the tool and get a snapshot of the system state. And this tends to miss a lot of events. So if your sockets are 100 milliseconds, uh, last 100 milliseconds because you have these fast transactions, and you pull the system every once in a while, you're going to lose a lot of uh, data. Uh, and this is one of the reasons why you want BPF. Uh, BPF is a great kernel subsystem uh, introduced into the Linux kernel with the BPF system call in uh, kernel version 3.18. So it's been around for a while. Uh, what it allows you to do is it, allow, it allows user space programs to specify code snippets that the kernel then runs on behalf of the user space programs on different kernel events. And usually these are function ex executions in the kernel. So when different things happen inside the kernel, so the snippet of code runs. Uh, it allows user space programs to extract data from the kernel very efficiently. Um, one advantage is you can get only changes into, uh, into state in the kernel, so only sockets that actually had data on them rather than all the sockets, for example. And it gives you access to internal data structures where you can extract more data that is not usually easily available to user space through uh, system calls. BPF is very safe. It's built with a verifier in the kernel that ensures that BPF code doesn't access invalid memory, doesn't loop forever, and so on. Uh, in fact, loops are forbidden BPF code completely. And the 
in the contexts, in all the contexts where uh, we kind of this talk in the, uh, runs BPF code, in all those contexts, the memory in the kernel is read only. So you cannot change anything in the kernel. Uh, BPF is also very fast. The kernel contains a just in time compiler that takes these uh, bytecode snippets and compiles them into very efficient machine code. So you can get this 100% coverage with very low overhead. Um, I want to run through a quick demo of how uh, BPF utilities, um, of, of some BPF utilities. I'm going to run on one of the Kubernetes clusters this utility called TCP Top from the BCC repository. It's a great open source project that has Python bindings uh, and many utilities uh, accessing kernel data structures with BPF. So here it is. I'm going to run TCP Top. Sorry. And you can see every second uh, TCP top prints all the sockets that were active during that second. Let's look at it more carefully. Um, well, sorry, I'm going to run it again just so we can see it. Uh, so you can see here is the SSH uh, that we're using in order to view this data. Uh, you can see the different uh, services in uh, the hipster shop communicating. Here's the cart service and so on. And uh, kind of by instrumenting these kernel, app, uh, kernel functions, so specifically TCP top uh, instruments send message and TCP cleanup RBUF, you can get pretty good visibility into what's happening. Um, when you build such a system, you need to be careful as you write this instrumentation. So here is the TCP top code that prints out results to the screen. Um, here, uh, this items call actually goes and fetches data from the kernel data structures that are shared between BPF code and user space, then analyzes them, does some, you know, puts them into a dictionary, and then clears that data structure. Um, and Kind of the, the reason I'm, I'm showing this is because when you write this type of code, you need to be careful about types of races. For example, in this case, between the time uh, the, the user space program reads all the state from the kernel and the time it clears the data structure so it doesn't have to read the same values, the kernel can insert new sockets. And all those sockets are cleared here, thrown away. So these are the types of things you need to be careful when you build a system for real. This would give you, by the way, the, the race here is pretty small, so it will give you 99% coverage, right? Like, you know, depending. Uh, so you'd miss 1% of traffic, but maybe you don't want to miss that. Like we, when we build these systems, we take care of all the edge conditions. We don't want to have this. Uh, so uh, kind of we've, we've gone through uh, BPF and uh, kind of a demo and kind of what things to pay attention to, and I want to talk a little bit about how to build this end-to-end -end as, uh, as a system to analyze this code. So first, um, kind of the agent interacts with the Kubernetes API and also other orchestrators, could be ECS, Docker, EC2, uh, and extracts data from Linux. It then forwards data into an analysis pipeline. Uh, the goal of the analysis server here is first, if you have an agent on both sides of the connection, uh, then, or, or agents on both sides of the connection, you want to match the two flows so that you get a coherent view of that flow from both sides. It then enriches that flow with metadata from the orchestrators and aggregates them uh, according to uh, some group buys. It groups by, group buys the data and materializes some view. And the idea here is you don't want to save raw socket data into your time series database because the queries are going to be uh, very slow. Uh, pushing it to time series database, um, we use Prometheus right now. And we found that uh, you can build very uh, cool APIs on top of this. Uh, because usually uh, when you have time series databases, uh, the labels are, you have one set of labels. Um, here with the, this flow data, you have a set of labels for the source, the set of data for the destination, and a set of uh, labels for the flow itself. So the APIs could be uh, much more convenient. You could, you could build APIs that are more convenient to work with this data. Um, what you'd want more is to build an analysis pipeline. So for example, uh, to, to, analyze, uh, to analyze this data and uh, create events. So one is like the standard 
uh, alerting that you get from, for example, Grafana. Um, other types of exa uh, exciting detectors you can build are, for example, this uh, version detector, where I have a new deployment, I detect a new version, and I want to see uh, are, is the new, does the new version behave the same as the old version. So these are pretty exciting things you can do, and um, we're looking for feedback there. So if you have cool ideas or want to discuss, I'd really love to talk about that more. Um, OK, so let's jump into evaluation of the system. So how does this behave? Is it going to be too expensive to run? Uh, we've run perf measurements. Uh, I've uh, included here kind of our methodology. Perf is a sampling profiler, so you get these stacks, uh, execution stacks from the kernel every here five million cycles. And you can analyze those and see how many cycles are um, statistically in each, uh, uh, in each function. Um, one thing to note is when you evaluate these monitoring systems, you need to evaluate not only the user space portion, which is what is readily accessible, but also the kernel overhead. Uh, so all of the measurements I'm going to show, I mean, uh, there, there's not a lot, but we, eva we evaluate the kernel overhead as well, which could be more. Uh, it's frequently more than the user space part. Um, what we've seen is uh, the collector that we've been using has 0.1 to 0.2 to a quarter percent per core CPU overhead across many deployments. Um, we do keep track of the highest overhead we've ever seen. We've had a, uh, one of our customers uh, run a very aggressive load test uh, on their servers. Uh, that their application uh, worked at 46%, which is very high for them. Uh, and with that application, our collector ran with uh, less than a percent, 0.86 percent CPU overhead. So this is the highest that we've seen. Is this going to be expensive in network overhead? Now you're sending all the socket telemetry every second to uh, uh, the analysis pipeline. So here uh, we have several different clusters that are running. These are uh, production clusters running. This is megabytes per second in throughput on the cluster in the workload itself. And you know, this is a flow data collection service, so it also monitors the amount of telemetry flowing to the flow, uh, to, to the flow analysis pipeline. So here is the amount of uh, telemetry in megabytes per second. And we found that in most, most cases, you can get under 0.5% uh, CPU overhead. And if you're running a very uh, intense workload where you have these tiny, tiny transactions and tons of them, uh, then you get higher network overhead. This is wow, 1.15 is what we've seen. Outliers are yeah, around 1%. Another point on how to build these analysis pipelines, what you could expect, the number of events. Uh, here I've, uh, I've uh, shown three different companies' um, deployments and the number of events that you get of every different types per second per agent. So, for example, company A has uh, 1,400 TCP events per second per agent. Um, here might be where you want to look, like total number of events per second per agent. So you could expect, if you're running a batch workload, to have around 100 events per second. If you're running a more intense uh, interactive workload, then several hundreds to thousands. Uh, what this means for the analysis pipeline is that you need to be ready to handle, let's say if you have a 50-node cluster, you need to be ready to handle hundreds low hundreds of thousands of events per second in this uh, analysis system, uh, much less if you have batch workload. Um, this is partly why we were motivated to write this in C++ to make sure we can control the overhead and latency. And we were able to support uh, several hundred nodes with a two-second latency uh, target uh, and hope to have thousands soon. So this is achievable. You just need to pay attention to the details. Um, so this, so here, kind of, we've done evaluation. Uh, I know this is a very uh, fast-paced talk, so uh, this just summarizes the evaluation. And at this point, I want to um, touch on the disadvantage that we that I mentioned earlier: um, getting application layer uh, metrics or error codes. Um, well, it turns out that BPF supports user probes. So what you could do is. Let me go on. Sorry, here. So um, we have a small uh, hello world server 
here. Uh, you can go look at um, the symbols that it has. This is, these are all the symbols that it has, all the applications. And, uh, and BPF allows you to hook into these functions and get telemetry. Um, we, let me run it. So I'm going to run the Hello World server, then use the BPF utility func count on this PID. And what I'm going to do is instrument root hello and get, this is a Go, uh, a, a Go executable, a Go binary. So I'm going to get all the net HTTP calls that have the word header in them. Mm -hmm. This frequently happens when I forget to kill the old server. Okay, and then I'm gonna curl the, the Hello World server and get some responses. So here, I'm gonna do it three times. And as you close the, the uh, func count tool, you can see that BPF was able to get to run three times on this function, write header. And specifically write function, write header, this function is where the error code goes out of the Golang uh, net HTTP handler. So it is very possible to write these BPF probes that get application level errors. So with this, um, I've, we've talked about flow monitoring, how to get uh, architecture health and cost visibility. Um, the benefits are uh, very easy deployment. You don't have to change the code. Uh, low overhead and visibility into external services. Uh, hopefully application metrics. Um, hope to, in the next talk, to talk about that more. Uh, and BPF is great technology for that. And with that, I'd love to take questions. And please reach out later, too. Um, we'd love feedback. We're in kind of this early access mode. It's very exciting. We'd love to talk to the community. So thank you. Okay, there's a question back. Hi, uh, could is it, it like an application layer for uh, make a stub or a mock so I can use my 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 own program like Python or or Go and I use that as a a gateway for the the, the, the Kubernetes cl cluster so I do not mock my make calls to to that. I'm sorry. Uh, can you talk a little bit slower and louder? I'm, I'm <laughs> sorry. It's hard to hear from here. Okay. Uh, can I use this as um, an application layer as a gateway to use this as a stub? So when I I create my tests on my application, I use it. I do not mock my calls. I use these guys as an application layer. So I call them and then return me. So you're asking if you can use BPF in order to interject into your code and modify it. Well, BPF is uh, specifically, uh, a lot of it is written as a read-only system. So if you want to write tests with it, it gets a little bit hard. Uh, there are places in the kernel where you can modify uh, packet contents, for example. But I think it might be heavyweight for a use case. If you r work a lot with packets, you might be able to use uh, BPF that way. Hi, um, thanks for the impressive um, tool. Uh, I have two questions. So it wasn't clear to me like whether you are collecting data from the host OS of a node or the OS for in, inside Docker images. And the second question I have is, it feels like the correlation between the OS uh, data and the Kubernetes data might not be 100% correct, especially when there are dynamic changes to IP tables, I don't know, to like 
path going up and down, state changes in Kubernetes? Mm -hmm. OK. So the first question was, are we monitoring inside containers or outside containers? Well, containers are built as a lightweight isolation mechanism in the Linux kernel. So by running as a privileged, so you can run as a privileged container or on the host and see everything that's running on the host. So you get this visibility into the containers while running one agent. So you, this is not a sidecar. You can run just one privileged daemon set on your machines. Um, your second question was uh, I'm, correlation. Uh, correlation between the. Oh, yes. So how do you match the data between uh, your orchestrator and your nodes? The, the correctness. The correctness, correct. Yeah, yeah. So luckily, many of, uh, for example, containers have a unique ID that is shared across the operating system and Kubernetes. So if you look at your uh, Kubernetes uh, uh, pod description, when you see the containers in there, it has the same UID that is used inside kernel data structures. So you can match those, and we do. So kind of the, the system we built uh, does. Uh, with PIDs, for example, you can have this, these problems. If, if you collected uh, process identifiers, then you'd have this problem where maybe the kernel reuses the same PID multiple times, but you, you rarely need to use uh, that. Um, TCP, for example, so port numbers are not reused very quickly, usually. So you could rely on that, but uh, frequently we just rely on container information. So you know the socket, what container it was, and then the other side, what container the, so the other side of the socket was, so you can match the metadata that way. And that's, um, there's very little error you can do there. We done? Thank you, everybody. <laughs> Happy to take more questions here. <laughs>